tends to increase across the board whenever there's a climate disaster as a result of displacement and impoverishment. But trans people especially face that. And it's already an issue, as we know, in this country with a very high murder rate of transgender people, especially transgender women of color. Um, and so any conversation about envi environmental justice should center the queer and trans experiences, not just because they're among the most affected, but also because queer and trans communities bring wisdom to the struggle. Um, for example, surviving oppressive societies often requires learning how to develop resilient and interdependent communities that challenge social norms and embrace collaboration. Um, and for this reason, LGBTQ plus activists have often been at the forefront of, public, of popular resistance. For example, by forcing environmental organizations like the Sierra Club to address the homophobia and transphobia within their own organization, rather ironically, because these are organizations that also promote equity and justice, but themselves might need a mirror um, for their own in in equities in their organization. So a few quick recommendations among many of them, um, more training and LGBTQ plus LGBTQ plus issues and care for healthcare workers and mental health professionals. So nursing students, as you go into your fields, please keep these in mind and do some research, learn about them if you don't already are familiar, aren't familiar with them. Um, call and vote for more federal, state, and local non-discrimination policies in housing, employment, and health. Um, partner with LGBTQ plus LGBTQ plus organizations to address access and discrimination, especially disaster relief, another area of inequality. A lot of times disaster relief is unequally distributed, partly due to bad data and tracking who is affected the most where. Um, and along that line, as you go into your fields and do your research, especially those of you interested in environmental science or social justice issues, um, factor in queer issues and data in your research. Um, and finally, and I'm going to end with this, support and follow organizations that amplify queer and trans voices. There's a real tendency to want to center um, ourselves if we are ourselves not a member of the affected community, but consider ourselves an ally or an advocate. We may be tempted to kind of center our own talking <laughs> and experiences, try to decenter and give opportunities to amplify those other voices. And a really great organization doing that, for example, is called Our Climate Voices. They have a wonderful listening series, an anthology of first person climate change narratives. And in their own words, they say, our mission is to humanize the climate disaster and through storytelling contribute to a shift in the climate change dialogue that puts the voices of those most impacted at the forefront of the conversation and to connect people with ways to support the community-based climate solution-making work that frontline and vulnerable communities are already doing to combat climate impacts. And that is ourclimatevoices.org. And that's all for me. Thank you. So it's kind of thin. <laughs> So hi again, um, I'm Dr. Adam Jambrone. I'm in the math department here. Um, so I guess I'll preempt this with, uh, I don't think that there's gonna be like one number or equation that's gonna magically solve climate change. I'm actually here to kind of advocate for uh, interdisciplinarity um, outside of just the quantitative and statistics kind of realm. Um, so to maybe connect back to what Doc and Autumn have talked about. So we think about climate change, we think about topics of justice, social justice, environmental justice. So we, we definitely want to think about who's impacted by climate change on the on the, the negative side of things. So who has um, who's taking the biggest brunt of the impact of climate change and all the negative effects. Um, also solutions, right? So I think what um, Emily is going to talk about will be solutions and um, how are those distributed as well in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> um, so trying to balance kind of both sides of that. So in terms of negative impacts, but also if we develop solutions, small scale, large scale, how are those distributed? So inequities uh, are part of the story in both of those. Um, so if you think about policies, so I think uh, Autumn alluded to um, redlining and um, kind of tied to that could be the creation of food deserts, um, gentrification. So we're kind of thinking about maybe local and um, state kind of government um, topics, uh, gerrymandering, uh, redistricting. So we just went through a census process in 2020 and um, the redistricting process comes out of that. And then the use and misuse of that process can definitely have uh, big impacts in terms of housing, generational wealth. All of these topics are um, very interrelated. Um, and they all come from not only just uh, individuals, but if you think about local, state, and federal government, um, these bodies have the power to both help and hurt. So we know that there's definitely always a chance for implicit and explicit bias. And unfortunately, um, on the national level especially, there's plenty of laws and um, things that were created over the past maybe 100 years or so at least um, that have negatively infect, uh, affected people. Um, 
so I think we kind of need to think about that side of things, but also solutions, right? This also means we have local, state, and federal government solutions. And then how does that scale is probably the biggest question. Um, so we're kind of looking for solutions. I'm going to, again, as I maybe said at the beginning, advocate for not just a quantitative answer. There's not going to be one statistic thing we can do that's going to magically solve the problem. Um, so I really want to kind of advocate for just the fact that we we all need each other. We need social sciences. We need writing. We need community organizations to all be involved in whatever the solution happens to be. Um, I think we have a little bit of danger when we think about media. And if you think about reading anything that comes out, anytime there's a number attached to something or a statistic attached to something, somehow we we think that, oh, that's a that's a neutral thing. It's a number. It's safe. There's no bias. There's nothing going on there. So if you have 20% of something, that 20% somehow doesn't carry any weight anymore because it's a number. So I definitely like to advocate for that's not the case. And we should be very careful with that because these numbers, if we think about the fact that these statistics are coming from real people, real lives, real lived experiences, those numbers are not necessarily uh, objective. There's definitely subjectivity. And then as soon as they connect to real life people, that means that there is the danger of implicit and explicit bias in terms of how those numbers, how those arguments, how those mathematical arguments, statistical arguments are used. So I think that's something that's always worth kind of keeping an eye on. It's very easy to, to kind of say, oh, that number sounds good. And then we're just going to move on without uh, really trying to address where that's coming from, what, what experiences are tied to that number, who, who did the analysis, what biases might there have been in the process of making that analysis. Um, similar. Same things with technology. Doc mentioned uh, AI and uh, algorithms, and we know that that is very much going to be part of our very near future. So for better or worse, like technological uh, advancement is like exponential growth. It happens very quickly. So it feels like every couple months now we have some new technology that's going to revolutionize the world. So we also have to be careful to um, take whatever comes out with a grain of salt. So yes, it's new and flashy. Yes, we can play with it. Yes, it's a cool new thing. But again, these things are made by human beings that have their own implicit and explicit biases. So we need to be very careful about what these technologies do. And then we need to be careful to not trust them for the solutions, right? So humans are very much part of the story. Um, so I think that really matters, right? So we think about quantitative information and we talk about quantitative research and maybe some of your majors and courses rely on that. You've also hopefully seen kind of qualitative methods that maybe can focus deeply on uh, a small group of people or an individual's lived experience. Both of those matter. So I'm kind of here just to claim that um, this is why liberal arts is a thing. So having a breadth of knowledge, yes, you specialize in something, but being able to experience other ways of knowing, other ways of learning, like we're going to need that. So we need to be able to understand quantitative statistical information because that is definitely part of the 21st century. Big data is everywhere. Data is driving all of your decisions and um, all of your behaviors, whether you know it or not. I think I'm stopping. Yep. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, but also qualitative. So just thinking about each other's lived experiences. If you're thinking about justice as tied to the queer experience, even if that uh, isn't an identity you hold, there's something to learn from that. So I think that's kind of where I'm where I'm coming from is that there's going to be a multifaceted solution. Sorry, there isn't going to the answer isn't 12 to climate like justice. We can't <laughs> solve it that quickly. Um, so we need each other. We need interdisciplinary work to happen at the local and federal level. Before I start from a housekeeping perspective, we have five minutes. Okay, I just wanted to, yeah. sorry, I didn't know the setup, so I was asking a few questions. Um, good afternoon or good morning. My name is Emily Marino. I work for the Shimon County Planning Department. I do have a little bit of a cold that I'm going over or getting over, so it's about a la as loud as I can do. <laughs> um, I will say um, my, uh, work in government is relatively new. I've only been working in local government for about three months. Prior to that, I've been working in the nonprofit sector for about 15 years. I actually came from an organization that you might know of, hopefully you know of, called the Friends of the Shimong River Watershed. I was the executive director of that for about three years. I've worked in the nonprofit sector in the Southern Tier for a long time. So we definitely get involved in various social issues. Um, and depending on what nonprofit I've been working for, however, I'm very passionate about environmental studies. I also have a background in anthropology, but a lot lesser than Doc. I only got my bachelor's, loved it, um, went on and worked in museums for a while, got a master's in museum studies, and then I also have a master's in business administration. So I have a kind of wide variety of information um, uh, and educational history. So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is bring it down to more of a local level. Um, and I'm, I'm not really going to talk. I'm going to ask you guys some questions, see if we can get some engagement from the group. 
So who's ever heard of the Justice 40 initiative? Can you raise your hand if you've heard of Justice 40? Okay, so my colleague knows the Justice 40, that's good. <laughs> At least her in our department knows. So Justice 40 is essentially President Biden's promise to deliver at least 40% of the overall benefits from federal investments in climate and clean energy to disadvantaged communities. So essentially the federal government is recognizing that there is an issue, there's grant money out there. And my job as the grants manager for Shimon County Planning Department is to help get grants so we can bring those federal dollars and those state dollars in to try to resolve issues, okay? <clears throat> so the federal government is recognizing that climate change disproportionately affects low socioeconomic communities. How many people here are from Elmira? Can I see you raise your hands if you're from Elmira? Okay. So hopefully some of you know uh, a little bit about Elmira that aren't from Elmira, but Elmira does happen to have a large portion of what they call areas of persistent poverty. So low socioeconomic communities. I'm gonna just hold up a map right here. Hopefully you guys can see this. This is essentially a map of Elmira and those blue areas there are what we call areas of persistent poverty, okay? So a large portion of the city of Elmira, which has a population of 26, thousand give or take um, according to the u.s census with 12.1 percent of those uh people in the population of black or african american which is compared to 13.6 percent in the nation so about the same for the national percentage um 7.5 percent or two or more races compared to 2.8 percent for the national average so a little higher than the national average for elmira and 25.5 percent of the community is living in poverty and 11.6% is the national average. So we are significantly higher in poverty rates than the national average in the city of Elmira. Can anybody guess about where Elmira College is in this map? Just shout out a, an idea. <laughs> Who said that, right in the middle? Yeah, you're right. Elmira College is right in the middle, that little blue dot, okay? So I'm gonna give you some statistics here. <clears throat> According to the EPA, the uh, ugh, environmental justice screening mapping tool shows that census tract one, which is right up here, so a little bit of the northeastern section of the city, uh, environmental justice ind indices for diesel particulate matter are up to 80 percentile for the nation. So diesel particulate matter, we're breathing in all that yummy stuff in census tract one, which is adjacent to your census tract, which is where Elmira College is located, okay? Ozone for this area is particularly high from the, in the national comparison at the 60th to 70th percentile, okay? Air toxic respiratory is high in the 70th to 80th percent percentile for the nation. Traffic proximity is the 60 to 70th percentile for the state and 70th to 80th percentile for the nation. And census track one has a high level of poverty and minority populations, right? Over here, over by the highway, which is right adjacent to census track six, which is where Elmira College is located. <clears throat> uh, additionally, the residents in Texas tra Census Track 1 experience asthma at the 97th percentile, okay? 91st for Census Track 2, which is right up here, so closer to Woodlawn Cemetery, if you guys are familiar with that, a little higher than Elmira College is located. And the 80th percentile, or 85th percentile for Census Track 4. These same Census Tracks immediately surrounding downtown Elmira, which is where Elmira College lo is located, show low life expectancy at the 91st, 59th, and 52nd percentile, respectively, okay? So those communities are disproportionately affected by poverty, and they are also disproportionately affected by climate change issues. I'm, I'm going to quickly, I, I'm going to take one more second. I also want to talk about, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody knows about it, well, we have a river running through Elmira. This map right here, those red, um, red parts, those show the flood risk percentile. So climate change, the river levels are rising, right? This red area here is at the 90th to 100th percentile for flood risk. So with our water levels rising due to climate change, we have to deal with that. And the blue right here shows the floodplain. There's the river. This is Hoffman Creek that runs pretty much adjacent to, if not underneath, Elmira College. So Elmira College is right here, I wanna say, and the river or the creek is right here. So these are all things that we have to take into consideration when we're thinking about climate change. I will not go over any more of this because I have taken too much time, but I wanted to just kind of bring it to a local perspective and talk about what we're dealing with in our community from a socioeconomic perspective and how 
climate change affects people disproportionately who are of a lower socioeconomic status. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Anyone? <laughs> I can ask Emily, what are some of the plans that you guys are working on to alleviate these risks for yeah. Elmira? So we are going after federal dollars. So the reason why I have all this information is we just applied for a grant for the U.S. Department of Transportation to update our bus garage. Um, so you, everybody know where Wegmans is? Yeah, there's a bus garage right across the street on Shemong, uh, Clem or Clement Center Parkway. Uh, that bus garage, uh, we're looking at potentially making it an alternative hub that could be part of the plan. But more importantly, we're looking to electrify our fleet. So taking those bus, those diesel engines that are pumping out that particular matter, and putting them to electrical vehicle. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, requirements that are gonna be coming down from state to go to uh, net zero by I think, what, 20, 23, 2050? I can't, I can't remember the exact date off the top of my head. Um, it's different depending on state and federal. Uh, but so there's funding for that and we're applying to get a grant to essentially do a study to put that into place. Mm -hmm. For those that don't know yet, or that maybe are starting to get into public um, or uh, business administration, businesses move fast, government moves slow. Okay, so it's going to take a long time um, for these things to put be put into place, but we're working to make those plans um, hopefully be a reality in the next five to seven years. I want to talk about one program we were just chatting about, um, and if you've been in my classes, you probably stick to death of hearing about this, but I just think it's so wonderful that we have this resource. So Elmira City also has a really high proportion of old homes with crumbling lead paint. So you get low income housing with not a lot of money to maintain it and kind of a shady landlord industry here, right? And so you've got a lot of kids who are living in homes with uh, high levels of lead exposure. And of course, what that means is that small kids who are exposed to lead paint suffer permanent developmental problems that cannot be um, remediated. So um, there's a lead grant program here in Elmira that if you apply, if you're a low income family, um, you apply for the grant, and they will come put the family in a safe place in a hotel, I think, and clean everything. Like go do an assessment, replace all the paint, replace the windows, do whatever needs to be done to make that house a safe and healthy place for kids to live at no charge to the um, residents. If you're a homeowner, you might have to bear some of the costs, but if you're a tenant, I think the landlord bears like, was it like a... So that 20%. is a city program, and uh -huh. I'm at the county, so I don't know oh, exactly. It. Got it. it got sounds it. like you're on the right track with that. Okay. <laughs> I, might, I mean, I hope I'm not getting any facts wrong, but I was very interested oh, because God. I live next to our college, and our house has lead paint. So I was very personally invested in this issue. Um, but I like to promote it because a lot of you who are local, like, spread it among your friends and family. Um, just put that on your radar because that can really make a meaningful impact in, you know, a kid's well-being. Some of the some of the other programs that we're doing is we're looking at improving our tree canopy, um, looking at doing tree inventories, uh, mitigating any sort of trees that are infected or, or, or potentially could cause a problem. Looking to increase our, our tree canopy in places that that need it. And uh, I just actually did a conference where we were talking about tree canopy and disproportionately again. Uh, locations of socio low socioeconomic status or high um, levels of or high amounts of uh, minority population typically don't have tree canopy. Okay, so those areas are hot, shade um, definitely helps with those types of issues. <laughs> you know, going under a tree in the summer is great. And then also trees can do things like absorb what we call storm water, which is um, rain that essentially runs off buildings, collects up all sorts of interesting materials. And if that is not absorbed into the ground and absorbed by trees, it just then gets into our water supply. So there's different information about that, uh, how tree canopies are important. And we're looking at those types of opportunities through grants from the state and federal government as well. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? 
Jane, I can't hear you because I'm I have um my ears are clogged from a cold. Yeah, Was somebody there anybody can tell me what you're for saying. The Black the bike trail? Well, there's bad bikes, like bikes, lame. Mm. Uh, we're not a city that's um, allowed to be bikes. I'm just wondering if the Mountain County has been conducted. So, an alternative transportation yeah. like bikes? Yeah, so we um, we're actually, we, we also just applied for another grant through the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation called the RAISE grants. And we're looking at improving pedestrian corridors. Um, we're looking at improving uh, transit opportunities. We have some plans that are currently in place where they're doing redevelopment um, in the city, specifically on East Water Street. They're looking at putting in potentially bike lanes. And again, all of this is potential, right? I don't know what the ultimate result is going to be, but one of the things that we're trying to do a good job of in the community is engaging with uh, engaging with community members and finding what is the importance to you in your community? What would you like to see here to make your com community more important? So if you see those public meetings that you can go to, I think there was one at the Steel Memorial Library um, a month ago, and that was about the East Water Street development um, project. And we wanted to find out, you know, things like that. How do we, you know, what, what are the, what are the issues in the community? Um, how can we meet the, the needs of, of citizens? And so that information, bringing that to those meetings is important. But yes, we do recognize it's an issue, but I think, you know, from a public uh, government perspective, the more voices can say the same things, the more likely those things are going to get accomplished. So, thanks, Jen. For the county, of course, that's black. I mean, the thing is, the county is not powerful. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that um, we're looking at, I think the reason why we're focusing right now on the city is because there's a lot of money available for historical disadvantaged communities. And Elmira has the largest proportion of historical disadvantaged communities. So we can leverage those funds and make them work um, you know, in the area that those funds are available. And then we can see if we can go out to some of the more wealthier communities in our community. But yeah, we're definitely thinking about those types of things. This is why it's so important to vote. Kind of an astonishing number of college students are just not voting. And when you vote, it's not just for, you know, on a federal level, like you're voting for local officials, representatives as well. And it's helpful to read the issues on the table. And if you care about this stuff, just go and spend your time. And it's a very easy thing to do. Yeah, uh, so I will say my boss is the county executive, ultimately, right? And if the county executive says that we've heard from the people that are voting that they want somebody in power that's going to care about tree canopy are going to care about bike lanes are going to care about these types of things, then he's going to say, we need to care about those things. We need to make those happen in our community because they're voting, they're voicing their concerns and they're making it heard to me. And then he's then giving those directives to us. So we are your, we're public servants. So tell us what you want and what you need to make your community a better place to live. And I will also say too, that some of these statistics that, I, that I'm sharing, like this information here, it's a really neat uh, website you can go to to find out tree coverage status in various counties up and down the Chesapeake Bay watershed, which if you don't know, the Shemung River is a headwater for the Chesapeake Bay, which is the largest estuary in the United States. Um, we're actually doing pretty good for tree cover, okay? If you look at other counties along that corridor, they're not doing as well. So you might think, oh, hey, Elmira's got a lot of issues, but Elmira also has a lot of benefits from a green perspective. We have significantly more tree coverage than Tompkins County even, so where Cornell University is located. So do your research when you're figuring out where you want to end up in your career and what is important to you, what your values are, and if that community supports your values. And like Autumn says, vote. <laughs> I was going to say, also, if you're a student, so sorry, Derek. Um, 
literally upstairs and across the way is career services. So if you're a student and you're looking for places to get involved with, a community partner is sitting right here um, for the area. So if you're thinking about community engagement opportunities, if you care about climate, if you care about social justice, there are plenty of organizations in the county, in the region, in the area that you can definitely get involved with. Um, community engagement, this could lead to internships, internships lead to jobs, right? This is all important stuff that if you really do care about the issues and you want to get involved, you can start small with a one-off thing. You can do some community engagement. You can build those relationships. And that's kind of a, that's kind of the whole point of that, right? That's, that's why we're here getting involved, finding a career path, finding what you care about. So as a student, like this is a great opportunity to learn about where you're in, your, the area you live in. Um, learn about what topics are of value, what you care about, and then find ways to get involved. And I want to emphasize the smallness. I think when we talk about big issues like social justice, climate change, there's um, maybe like a very natural instinct to just not want to look at it too directly. Like our own mortality, we don't want to think about it because it's kind of awful to contemplate. And so we do a lot of avoidance. And sometimes, you know, even if we care a lot about something, we may feel so daunted by the enormity of the problem and the smallness of ourselves that we feel like, ah, eh, someone else will take care of it. It's not, I don't have any power in my own life to do. You can do little, little tiny things, just like one small thing. And those are cumulative. If, if, you, if lots of people do little small things, that's actually a massive impact. Right. And if you in your own life continue to do one small thing after one small thing, again, that's a cumulative impact. So if you feel like you're you know, you care about something, don't don't feel like you can't put your foot in at any point. Just find that one little that little crack that you can do something. And a lot of times that's very motivating and gives you the confidence and the knowledge to know which doors you can open to make further changes. And Sorry, I didn't mean to cut off Derek. I cut him off after Adam cut him <laughs> off. So I'm double cut. I doubled the insult. This question once again. Um, is there anything within the sphere of the audience about um, what kind of help and assistance can be given to um, the homeless and not just a minor in the county? I will say that being that I am three months onto the job, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, it is something that I am more aware of from working with friends of the Shemong River Watershed. The homelessness task force that's run through the Catholic Charities is something that I was involved in and familiar with, um, but I do not know the answer to that question at this point. However, if you want to speak to me afterwards, give me your business card, I can find out. Yeah. I'd also like to do a quick plug for our, our climate smart communities. Um, we have our coordinator right here in um, the crowd. She's one of my colleagues at the Shimon County Planning Department. So Shimon County was actually recently named a bronze certified climate smart communities, which is a New York state designation. And we're working on going towards our silver certification. It's a variety of different things that you can get involved in. We're in the early stages, but you might start hearing more information about that going forward. <laughs> And I also noticed um, since I've been in the environment, um, the energy costs, like our energy costs are like, <laughs> and I like cut some of the energy costs. For in terms of individual staff, I mean, like faculty, I think yeah. turn off your lights when you leave the room. Like there's little little things we can do. Try to care about your, you know, how much printing you do. I'm terrible about that. Um, but yeah, there's uh, those are questions. I wonder, like, for example, why are some of the building lights on all night? I don't know why. There's nobody there. I would say collaborate. Find other people that are interested in what you're interested in. Create a group, get organized, and speak speak up to administration create a voice you know the more people that you have that are interested in what you're trying to solve the more strength you have behind voicing those concerns to administration you can come to them and give them a simple action plan like 
hey, here's an action plan that we're going to go around and make sure the lights are shut off. Our volunteer group is going to make sure the lights are shut off every day at a certain time. And you can show them that that's going to save them X amount of money. Then you can kind of get more energy behind that potentially. With all your free time on top of having to work and going to class. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm ashamed because I mean, I don't want to work with everyone's but a lot of my friends need to work and work with them and so and also if you were in a place where in grade school you don't have time to participate in public like the green things we went on campus like the bargaining club and my science club or whatever you just don't have the energy and time to do that and if you're brown you're going to my real question is going to be the and like almost the amount of daily things because you don't have your energy to get involved with things like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just concerned about that. Like, if you want them to be able to go out and work the strength or garden or any of that stuff, like the solution that we want to see because there's too much on them. So maybe you maybe you can volunteer and advocate on their behalf since you have the time and find other people who are interested in the same thing half the time, potentially, right? That's the solution I would suggest. Maybe. <laughs> I was gonna say too, um, so Emily having a role with finding grants. I think if you're a student and you're interested in figuring out what that process looks like, there's nothing to say that a student couldn't search for help. Mm -hmm collaborate, form a group to look for grants? Because I think you mentioned sensors for, for lights, right? Yeah. How much would that help or figuring out heating, right? Why do I have to open a window when it's 80 degrees in the building, like rather than just not having it be as hot uh, in the building? So I think there's definitely room. So this maybe is a place where technology can help yeah. uh, the cause. So I'd say if you have a group of friends, if you want to just start even like an asynchronous, like a Google document, and we're going to spend five minutes on some web hunting for grants that are tied to technology mm -hmm. solutions. I think that's one thing that the administration would, would love. And I think we would, we're would we always looking for things like that to where we can get external support from local, state, national government uh, agencies. This also gives you great experience as a student too. Of you can see yourself in a community organization at some point in your future, either as a, um, a main career or as just part of what you wanna do in life grant funding, looking for sources of funding, how do you convert your idea into action and plan? Is that that's all good stuff. That's stuff that employers care about, future employers are going to care about. So I'd say look at it. That's great. That's a really, really strong carrot to put in your bag when you leave college. Grant writing is exceptional. And by the way, undergraduates, I've worked with plenty of undergraduates that have written grants and got the money and did an amazing projects. So if you feel like you're I mean again it can feel daunting. But reach out to your faculty. If you have a faculty, if you have a professor who you know you have a good relationship with, or that you just like the work they do, or think they would be a good advisor, reach out to them. And say, hey, would you mind mentoring me? I'm going to apply for this grant, but I would like to have you know some guidance and mentoring and coaching on the process. And I can't imagine any faculty who would be resistant to that. I've always really enjoyed working with students who have done these amazing things based off their own hard work, ideas, ingenuity, and and then succeeded. And went on and we're awesome. <laughs> uh, so a grant is set, like if, if you if you've applied to college, you can write a grant. That's my opinion. Yeah. A grant is essentially an application. So uh, federal government, state government, they have these pots of money and they provide these applications where you can essentially uh, apply to it based on if what you want to do aligns with, with what they want to fund. You typically have to write a narrative about it. You have to put together a budget. You have to put together a project timeline and say you're going to meet X, Y, and Z. But it's just really kind of like doing a college application and writing a paper, but it's a contract. So what ends up happening is if you're then awarded, you are then in a contract with that funder to do what they say, uh, what you said you had to do. So typically nonprofit organizations can apply to grants. I'm pretty sure Elmira College is a nonprofit organization, right? Okay, yep. Uh, governments can apply to grants. You can also potentially, like, let's say you you have this idea you want to do something. You can partner with somebody at the college, and they can they can potentially partner with some of the administration, and you can apply under the college. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to help with that kind of stuff. I think that what you're talking about and what you want to do is fantastic. I also love helping students. I actually teach grant writing. Um, for another college, well, actually not college. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, but happy to help with any of those types yeah. of things. Just Google it, 
it sounds daunting, but once you get into it, you'll be fine. And like I said, if you apply to college, you can, you can get, apply to a grant. And sometimes <laughs> when you apply for a grant, you can also apply for like a salary for folks who want to work with you on the grant. Right. And that could be a really good thing to think, keep in mind for those students who might want to be more involved, but have to work all these crappy jobs to mm -hmm. get through paying the tuition. And that could be now. I mean, yep, absolutely. Yep, that it up. Even smaller, medium-sized grants, right? So you kind of think about what would I make hourly, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can factor that in and say, okay, I expect to work this many hours per week on this mm -hmm. on this project, on this initiative. And then you can budget that in. And then of course there's some back and forth with like the funding. So you, you know, apply for maybe a little more than what you might actually get. But then if it lands at something that's still feasible, then you accept it, they accept it. Um, so yeah, that's definitely another opportunity. So I think it's something worth exploring. So that that particularly like the light sensor idea, I think there has to be a group of students, faculty, staff on campus that want to form some sort of task force that could, I imagine, be part of the sustainability, the campus college sustainability committee. So maybe we report to them or maybe we update that committee with what's going on or get their blessing to, to pursue the grant, to look for some grants. And there's also local grants. I mean, there's there's things that you can apply to locally that don't require so much paperwork, some of these like federal and state grants, and they want to support the kind of initiatives that you're talking about. Um, just a side note, because I imagine we might be closing. Um, Doc was talking earlier about digi indigenous communities. I'm reading this great book right now. I just want to do a plug for it. It's called Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, I don't know if anybody knows about it. The author is Robin Wall Kimmerman. Kimmer? Kimmer? Can't Kimmer. speak. Yeah, and it's a great book. Uh, she's a, a scientist with an indigenous heritage, and uh, she's talking about essentially how we always we haven't always been at odds with our environment. Just if you want to have an interesting read, if you if you got too much going on, you want to pick it up on Audible. She's got a really nice reading voice. So. And we do have a new sustainability committee on campus that is looking into things like getting certified with different organizations. Um, and one of the advantages of that is we could apply for grants for things like, you know, replacing our old light bulbs at the dome with more up-to-date technology that would use much less elect electricity. Um, so we're we're working on it. Um, it's just we're kind of like a government. It's a slow process. You know, we're trying to grade papers and then meet once a month to figure all this stuff out on top of that. So if you have ideas, if you have specific complaints, let us know. Let me know. Let Dr. Browning know. Let Derek back there know. Let Charlie. I see a lot of the committee members. Layla, I think you might be on the committee. So share your thoughts and concerns, and we it will trickle up, and we will talk about it and come up with a game plan. Um, but that's what we're trying to do across the college. Mm -hmm. Any final um, questions before we wrap up? Okay, and if you haven't, haven't any of the students who haven't signed in, please do that. Um, it's floating around or else I have extras up here. And there's an upcycle flea market right behind the library. Uh, there are vendors in the CC right now. And there's more panels at 115 here and Meyer and kind of all over campus. Um, so please stick around and hang out and join us all day long. Great. Thank you.